Brazil's Dilma Rousseff fights for her political survival. Abandoned by her main coalition partner, the embattled leader is trying to keep other allies on side. Just why is Brazil going through its worst political and economic crisis in years? And will Rousseff's opponents succeed in having her impeached? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Fully Batibo. It's a combination potent enough to bring down most governments. The worst recession in 100 years, a massive corruption investigation and a push to impeach the president. But Brazilian leader Dilma Rousseff isn't quite ready to give up yet. She now heads a minority government after losing her main coalition partner and she's struggling to save both her own reputation and the legacy of the Workers' Party who have ruled Brazil for 13 years. Lots for us to discuss today, but first this report from Al Jazeera's Gabriel Elizondo. Brazilian President Dilma Rousseff is fighting for her political survival. Less than 24 hours after the biggest political party in Brazil pulled out of her ruling coalition, Rousseff held an event here at the presidential palace where she unveiled new housing projects for the poor. But she used the opportunity to push back forcefully against her critics and left in no uncertain terms how she feels about the impeachment process being waged against her. Impeachment without proof of crime of responsibility is what? It's a coup. This is the issue. There's no point pretending that we are discussing a hypothetical impeachment. We are discussing a very concrete impeachment without crime of responsibility. There's no point in discussing whether impeachment is or is not written in the Constitution. It is. But what is not written is that without crime and responsibility, impeachment can be passed legally and legitimately. The name of that is coup. Here at Congress, a special committee continues their impeachment hearings. They expect to conclude their work by the second week of April. As for Rousseff, her popularity continues to plummet. A new poll shows that 69% of Brazilians disapprove of the job that she's doing. On Thursday, more protests are planned in a country that is divided as ever, and a president is trying desperately to hold on to her job. Well, corruption is inescapable in Brazil, and though the whole political class is implicated, it's Rousseff's Workers' Party that's been taking most of the blame. The party was accused of buying votes in 2005 under the government of then-President Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva. The current scandal has been dubbed Lava Jato, or car wash. It's alleged that the government used funds from the state-run oil company Petrobras to pay bribes that helped it politically. Around 50 politicians from across the political spectrum have been charged or jailed. Even the opposition leader who launched the impeachment process is being investigated as are half the members of the impeachment commission. Rousseff herself hasn't been implicated in any kind of corruption, though she is accused of negligence. Lawmakers say she broke budgetary rules by trying to hide the size of Brazil's deficit, though it's unclear if that's an impeachable offence. So let's bring in our guests for today's Inside Story now. Joining us in London, Alfredo Saad Filho, Professor of Political economy at the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London. In Brasilia via Skype, David Fleischer, Emeritus Professor at the University of Brasilia. And also in London, Carlos Casedo, Senior Principal Analyst for Latin America at IHS Country Risk. Gentlemen, welcome to you all. Thank you for being on Inside Story. David in Brasilia, if I may start with you, a recent article in The New Yorker described Dilma Rousseff as the Richard Nixon of Brazil. Do you agree? Do you think she'll know the same fate or can she politically survive this crisis? Uh, the chances of her political survival have been reduced to maybe 10 or 15 percent. The comparison with Nixon is not completely perfect because Nixon acceded to the pleas from the Republican Party who said, please, you must resign or our party will be wiped out in the November elections. And he did resign. Uh, Juma Hosef will not resign. She's fighting tooth and nail and going down shooting uh, to the last minute to defend her government and to defend her mandate. The crimes of responsibility are charged of violating the fiscal responsibility law from 2000 by uh, uh, 
making expenditures with no congressional authorization. The impeachment committee will have to decide whether that is really a crime of responsibility or not. Okay. Uh, Alfredo in London, David, as David has said, she is fighting tooth and nail. Uh, her supporters have described the campaign against her as tantamount to a coup because they say she didn't really commit any crime and that the what she's being accused of is not really impeach, impeachable. Do you agree with that? Do you think there's a wider conspiracy here against Dilma Rousseff? I think there has been an attempt to remove Pre President Rousseff from office since she won re-election in 2014. Several avenues have been attempted and the avenue of the moment is the one of uh, impeachment. But quite clearly, in my view, she has not committed any impeachable uh, offence. It is paradoxical that, as you mentioned in your introduction, the majority of the Congressional Committee investigating this case have themselves been accused of corruption. About three-fifths of the members of Congress are under investigation. The President herself is not. Mm -hmm. So the consequence of this, uh, I think, is very, very serious. The consequence will be, in the short term, an attempt to remove President Rousseff from office, to stop the corruption investigations that have now enveloped the political class. Uh, but in the longer term, the consequence is the disintegration of constitutional politics uh, in Brazil. So would you say that there are forces working right now to undermine her? Again, that there's a wider conspiracy going on here. There's a wider attempt to remove the president from office. There's no doubt about this. And this involves uh, part of the Congress. This involves a large part of the opposition political parties. This involves the vast majority of the mainstream media. Uh, this involves uh, part of the judicial system itself that is now uh, significantly divided uh, too. Carlo in uh, London, uh, she was re-elected in 2014, not convincingly, not as convincingly anyway as in 2010. She has lost the political support today and also, it seems, lost confidence from the Brazilian people. Do you think Dilma Rousseff will finish her term or is impeachment inevitable at this stage? Well, um, I think it's unlikely that she will finish her term. I, uh, we, in December, uh, we thought that actually she had aligned the numbers in Congress to, to prevent uh, the impeachment. And uh, when there was a, a particular ruling from the Supreme Court in which uh, they challenged uh, the, the head of the lower house, Eduardo Cunha, who is the person who gave the green line to this. But then two, two things happened since then, which we have changed the whole picture. One is the huge anti-government demonstration of 13 of March. Mm -hmm. uh, and secondly, the brief arrest for questioning of President Lula. Those two developments changed the whole dynamics and brought back to the table the um, the possibility of the impeachment. I think there was a, a, a clear mistake from, from, from Dilma's side, which was to appoint or to try to appoint pres former President Lula as chief of the staff at a moment when a, a, a judge, Sergio Moro, was uh, ready to investigate him and prosecute him. And this was read as a way of shielding right. Lula from prosecution. This generated a lot of protest. So, I think um, the chances now of, of Dilma surviving are far, far less than, than two, two months ago, and possibly she will not finish. Was the purpose of bringing back uh, uh, Lula uh, as a chief of staff, which hasn't happened yet, uh, was the purpose, as you say, to uh, shield him from prosecution, really, or, or were there other objectives there? Was there something else that she was thinking about by bringing back Lula as chief of staff? Well, it, it's very difficult to say with certainty, but but I think uh, uh, she should ha if she was going to bring Lula to her government, she should have done that six months ago when Lula was uh, in a better position to help her. But to bring Lula at the moment when a judge in Curitiba want to investigate Lula is very difficult to justify, and that created a very difficult situation to handle. Now, there is another element which, which I think uh, Alfredo mentioned before. We have a serious concern here mm. about the proper separation of the politics and the judiciary. Some of the decisions of the judiciary, particularly from Judge Sergio Moro, 
uh, are quite questionable. For example, his decision to release a telephone conversation between President Rousseff and Lula, I think, was out of the line. I, I doubt that would be legal and acceptable okay. for the federal police to to intervene the phone of David Cameron here or President Obama in the U.S. I think there was something there which is legally quite challenging. Right. There have been a, a lot of questions, of course, about how this all uh, went about. Uh, let me bring in David in Brasilia once again. David, uh, Carlo mentioned uh, the uh, March 13th anti-government demonstrations, of course, against Lula. We saw a lot of people on the streets of Brazil in several cities. Who is behind this revolt today against Dilma Rousseff? We hear a lot about uh, the Brazilian middle class or the upper middle class. Who makes up this middle class and what exactly are they unhappy? happy about today. And the lower middle class are very dissatisfied with how the economy is going. Very high inflation, GDP retraction last year, uh, large unemployment, and a lack of credit to be able to purchase anything. The demonstrations and protests on the 13th of March were about 6 million people in maybe 100 different cities. So that was what was called the voice from the streets. There are two uh, NGOs, one called uh, uh, come, come Into the Streets, and the other uh, was the Free Brazil Movement that did the organizations. These are very <coughs> young Brazilians who have been doing this articulation uh, via internet. The, the question of whether Lula should be a member of, of, of Dilma Rousseff's cabinet is, is very significant because, number one, she wanted to shield him from uh, prosecution. Mm -hmm. But also she wanted to bring him into her cabinet so he could articulate and lobby the parties uh, in, in her favor. But then a Supreme Court judge issued an injunction suspending his appointment. And that may be decided by the full Supreme Court, maybe perhaps next week or the, the week after. But this is really too late because the impeachment decision by the Chamber of Deputies might be made on April 17th which is a Sunday. That means that the long roll call vote, which might take four or five hours, will be broadcast live all over Brazil on a Sunday. That also means that that Sunday, no Brazilians will be watching any soccer games. They'll be watching the roll call vote in the Chamber of Deputies. Huh. There's another a process ongoing in our election court to try to cancel the election of the slate of Jim Josef and Michel Temer because of the use of corruption funds from Petrobras, illicit funds, in financing the campaign in 2014. Mm -hmm. If the election court decides that, then uh, both uh, will be suspended, will be removed, the president and the vice president. So we have another case ongoing in the election court, but the impeachment proceedings uh, are proceeding much more rapidly than at the election court. Uh, Alfredo in London, do you think she'll be able to secure the political support of her remaining allies, or is it too late, as David says? It will be very difficult, I think, for President Rousseff to keep a coalition together that will sustain her uh, during the next few months. But this is not how it should be going. Brazil has a presidential system, not a parliamentary system, and a president does not lose office if they are in a minority in Congress. They lose office if they lose elections. And Dilma Rousseff won the elections. She should be allowed to complete her administration. I'm not at all suggesting that her government is perfect, mm -hmm. very far from it. Right. But she did win fair elections. And what is going on at the moment is an attempt to overthrow her illegally. Okay, G tell us more about the background because, you know, we hear a lot about corruption in Brazil today, Alfredo. But corruption scandals have been a, a feature of Brazilian politics for a long time now. And for years, the Workers' Party, Dilma Rousseff's party, was seen as uh, the only honest political party in uh, Brazil, particularly when they were in the opposition. When did it start to go wrong for them? When did they start getting their hands dirty, if you will? The PT, um, as you mentioned, thrived in opposition by pretending to be the only honest party in Brazilian politics, and it might have been true at that point in time. But when they decided to win elections instead of uh, losing with honor, and that was uh, during the uh, late 1990s, early 2000s, they moved into conventional politics. And conventional politics in Brazil, much like in the United States and in other countries, moves on the basis of uh, donations that cannot be legally registered, uh, mm -hmm. donations from large uh, companies, 
uh, and then they buy the campaign machinery that is necessary to win the votes. The PT uh, in all likelihood did that just like any other party. What is happening today is an attempt to implicate the PT alone in corruption scandals when in fact the um, flows of funds and the scandals themselves are scattered across the entire political system. So the investigations are biased in that respect. But you do have a democracy that is dysfunctional in the sense that it cannot exist within the rules that it has set uh, to itself. Okay. Uh, do you agree with that, uh, uh, Carlo, in London? Uh, Alfredo says that even if the PT is removed from power, even if Dilma Rousseff goes away, the corruption is not going to go away necessarily. Well, I tend to agree with that. Uh, and I think there is a more fundamental issue here is I think Brazil needs, in addition to one, all this is over, a serious political reform. Uh, you don't have the, a political system in Brazil that, that will allow a single party or two parties to govern the country. The only way you can rule Brazil is through coalition. Did you look at the current government coalition? It's about 10 or 11 parties. So the only way you could rule Brazil is by horse trading, by giving favors or asking favors, by, by doing deals which not necessarily are the best ones or legal ones. So I think the Brazilian will need to think very hard about political reform because the current way of doing polit politics in Brazil conspire against a clean government because of the nature on the traditional way of doing politics in Brazil. The hope is that after this crisis, some significant reform will come out from there. Uh, at least, for example, in December 2014 was introduced the new anti-corruption law. The foreign companies operating in Brazil will need to look very careful at this because the way, old way of doing business in Brazil is over and the situation has changed radically. But at the political level, a serious reform is also needed because the way politics op operates in Brazil really push political parties to do all this kind of backdoor deal and business, and that's how corruption came into the picture. Uh, David, in Brasilia, do you agree that serious political reform is needed in Brazil? And also, the question today is, what, sh what has to happen first? Do we need uh, the economy to get better first? Because that seems to have contributed greatly to, to the current political crisis. What comes first, the economy getting better or uh, a serious political overhaul first? Uh, both would be uh, on, the, on the table in, in a new government if the vice president takes over. The economy is, is he likely is a, to take over though because he's not very popular himself that's true but the way the constitution uh, reads is that if the president leaves or is impeached the vice president takes over the problem with the economy is that the private sector has lost total zero confidence in this government and has not been investing very much at all and so the task of the new president would have to show the private sector that this is a serious government and restore confidence so that the private sector begins investing again. That would begin to turn the, uh, the economy around. The problem with Petrobras is that this was our, a large state enterprise corporation in Brazil, the largest company in Brazil, our petroleum monopoly. Before this all began, Petrobras' market value was around $400 billion. Mm -hmm. Now when Petrobras has been almost destroyed, the market value is around $30 billion. And so we had about 20 construction companies conspiring in a cartel to get Petrobras contracts. But to do so, they had to pay very high and large bribes to the Petrobras directors to, to achieve these contracts. Mm -hmm. So for the first time in Brazil, the first level federal judge in Curitiba, Sergio Moro, has put about 30 of these uh, CEOs and CFOs and managers of these large construction companies in jail, and some have received prison, prison terms. Mm -hmm. uh, and they have been, been doing a lot of plea bargaining to try to reduce their prison terms. And so this plea bargaining uh, has brought up new information because plea bargaining has to have good documentation. And so a lot of new accusations have come out of this plea bargaining. Now the CEO of the largest construction company in Brazil, Odebrecht, is in the process of doing his plea, plea bargaining. And Brazilians say that would be a major earthquake in Brazilian politics because this company has been 
uh, financing and contributing to political campaigns of many politicians in all parties. Right. And so Brazil is anxiously awaiting the results of his plea bargaining. It, we have a, a, a popular initiative legislation before Congress with two million signatures proposing 10 very, very strong anti-corruption measures. If Congress approves these measures, this would strengthen the, judi the judiciary in prosecuting corruption. We also need, as was okay. said, uh, okay. measures to for political reform, okay. reducing there, the there fragmentation. Are, there are a lot of, of things to do. Let, let me just bring in uh, um, our other guests, uh, if you, if I can, David. Let, let me bring in Alfredo. Uh, Alfredo, David mentioned uh, Sergio Mauro, the, the the judge who initiated this whole investigation, and, and the media, the Brazilian media, seem to have turned him into some sort of hero who can do no wrong. Why is it that this individual, Sergio Mauro, why is he in such high standards uh, in, in Brazil today? Because he has been doing a particularly useful job for the opposition. He has uh, twisted the investigations on corruption against the PT, focusing almost exclusively on the PT. He has selectively leaked information uh, to the media via or through himself and through the federal police uh, to foster an atmosphere of scandal that is now bearing fruit. But he did overstep the mark, as one of your guests mentioned previously, by releasing taped conversations between the president and former president Lula. Right. He has had to apologize for that. So who is able, in your view, to reconcile the country today? This will be very difficult. Um, the economy is in a deep uh, crisis, as you mentioned, and the political system is very deeply fragmented. And I believe uh, it will be very difficult to restore uh, trust and a measure of conviviality in Brazilian politics. Something has broken um, and the uh, political climate is the worst I have seen in the last 30 years. Something has broken, uh, Carlo uh, Alfredo says. How can it be fixed, in your opinion? Well, um, I agree the, the picture is extremely grim. Uh, when you look at, at, at the op political options, really, there are not many. Uh, my, my, my gut feeling is that one of the beneficiaries of all this would be Marina Silva, uh, the former presidential candidate and former minister of the environment and the president Lula. Mm -hmm. um, she could actually capitalize on this, but I think Brazil really need new political parties and political parties attached but all the old politics. Okay. But there is no any clear leader or clear political party there apart from Marina Silva. And when you look at Marina Silva, you really need to look at uh, her capabilities logistically, but also her, um, as a party to be able to actually rule rule the, 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 the country. Okay. So it's too early to say, but at least she would be one of the beneficiaries, but definitely you will need new players in the political landscape, new political parties okay. different from the one that Brazil have now and are totally unpopular. Okay. even as unpopular as Dilma Rousseff. Okay, David, you have the last word in Brasilia. You know, when Lula left office, uh, his approval ratings were at 90%, and many had speculated that he could return in 2018. But where does this scandal today leave the Workers' Party and, and its legacy? Now, this scandal has not destroyed the, the Workers' Party, but it has damaged the Workers' Party tremendously. The Workers' Party will probably elect a lot less mayors and city council members in, no, in October this year. Uh, Lula, when he left office, as you said, was became an icon with 80 or 90 percent approval rating and GDP growth in 2010 of 7.5 percent. But this whole scandal has dragged him down and his icon status has been tarnished. The survey research polls show that in 2018 he might not make it into the, to the second round. Mm. Marina Silva is leading and I assume the average in the PSDB in, in second place. So uh, we'll have to see what type of political leaders would emerge. Okay, we'll leave you there. Thank you so very much for an interesting discussion. Alfredo Saad, Philo, David Fleischer, and Carlos Casado. Thank you for being on Inside Story. And thank you for watching. As always, you can watch the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's at facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter as always. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Fuli Batibo, and the whole team, thanks for watching. Bye for now.